1992, Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro published a uh, landmark study of uh, indigenous people in the Amazon as he spent some time uh, living with uh, with people in the in the middle of the, the forest. And he points out this book is an ethnography of the Arawete, a Tupi Guarani people of the eastern Amazonia, middle Xingu, Brazil, that intends to situate them within the South American ethnological corpus, in particular within the panorama of the Tupi Guarani linguistic family. Its focus is the description and interpretation of the Arawete cosmology approached from the perspective of concepts about the person, death, divinity, and systems of shamanism and warfare. The theme of divine cannibalism, central to the Arawete definition of the human condition, will be treated as part of the complex of Tupi Guarani uh, ritual anthropophagy, so um, cannibalism. Along with this guiding thread, I will propose a vision of Arawete metaphysics that explores the place of humanity in the cosmos, its fundamental inscription within temporality, and the logic of identity and difference that governs the distinctive ontology of this group. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is uh, what we are talking about here. So, first of all, the word ontology refers to technically the metaphysical uh, existence of being. So uh, what being is, uh, what is, um, as, uh, as uh, plainly stated as it could be. Um, more importantly, uh, for our purposes here, what he mentions uh, here is the, the place of humanity in the cosmos is uh, probably the closest thing we can get to in terms of explaining this anthropologically, because um, for a good while now, we have been putting people at the center of uh, most studies, and uh, it might not be the case for everyone else in the world in terms of their science. So ontology, generally speaking, the study of what is as questions about uh, whether a thing could be universal or particular. So if it is universal, then we know or we approach a point of ontology where everyone believes in the same thing. If it is particular, then it turns out to be more of an epistemology that is a, a way to understand things. If it is concrete or abstract, if it's connected or independent, Essentially, uh, whether it is a matter of uh, philosophy or metaphysics, uh, ontology tends to make sense out of things, uh, hopefully, that are uh, more or less disconnected slash connected to the world around them. So making sense of uh, things that are outside of the social world that we are making of them is obviously rather important, but as far as the anthropology is concerned, and anthropology being very much focused on society and culture, the role of ontology has much more to do with what we would tell to call ontological analysis. That is, what words or what concepts we use to make sense of our connections or disconnections, that is, from the world around ourselves, which is a slightly different twist on this uh, concept here. So essentially the specific concepts and categories used in a domain. Now, uh, uh, if you if you are interested in uh, computer science, uh, 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 language processes processing typically uses this idea of ontology to make sense out of uh, out of certain vocabulary. So, uh, if you are uh, doing a study on uh, on, the, on artificial intelligence that has to do with uh, business, for example, then there's going to be an ontology that contains all of the words that people typically use in the context of business. Uh, if you make a, 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 an um, artificial intelligence that based on tennis, then you will have an ontology that gathers all the words about tennis. So grandly speaking, this is what we are talking about here, except, well, these are humans doing the understanding here. And so the, the little diagram that's posted here um, helps you hopefully make sense out of what is me meant here. On the one hand, you have uh, on the left the ontological theory, so the large concepts. On the right, you have models or modeling and notation, so specific um, sp specific connections that are made between certain ideas, and then the uh, 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 the two domains are interacting with one another. When you have a word, that word is connected to a broader idea. That broader idea is connected to another word in the ontology. The ontology connects to another word, etc. So there is a uh, a dialogue, a, a dialectical relationship between the ontological theory and the modeling that goes through representation and interpretation, which 
you know, by and large is how we tend to understand most things by interpretation and um, and uh, and representations. So uh, uh, anthropo uh, uh, ontological anthropology doesn't look at what really is, because obviously real is uh, always a matter of an interpretation and a representation. And more importantly, it, for our context, ontological anthropology tends to remove the social perception of things from the equation of representation and interpretation. So what if there were no humans seeing those things? Would they be the same? And think of it as a Schrodinger's experiment of uh, of thinking, if you will, where uh, the things that are universal tend to be exemplified in different ways in different places. Things that are concrete seem to have uh, different uh, names behind them, et cetera. So uh, uh, it, it's really a, a big word uh, for for more important purposes, and uh, in, in the sense that it is a, a big word and it is a, a philosophical word, it has a very fraught idea. And uh, at this point in time, it's not really useful to get too deep into what that means uh, for the science itself. But it also has to do with the fact that when we think about things, we typically will tend to look at uh, things through the eyes of somebody or someone. And perhaps in the context of anthropology, we could start with looking at things from the context of the culture itself. So this is from uh, Wagner, a little bit of an older work that is um, considered typically a, a pioneer of, of ontological anthropology, even though he does not use that word. The logic of a society where culture is the conscious and deliberate thing where life subser subserves some purpose rather than the reverse and where every fact or proposition is required to have a reason creates a strangely surrealistic effect when applied to tribal peoples. So little, in fact, are their functions, social facts, or logical structures of the mind believable in one's experiences with natives as people, quote unquote, on the ground, that we are forced into the position that the reasons and purposes adduced theoretically are subliminal, subconscious, or implicit universal properties. So <clears throat> Roy Wagner mentioned here, and uh, Viveros de Castro in a previous slide that we'll get back to in a second, um, uh, points out to the fact that if we try to apply Western European mental processes to indigenous folks, the only way that we can make sense out of is uh, trying to think of it in all those magical terms that they have a subconscious understanding of the things that we call culture, politics, religion, and whatever, when in fact, of course, they are fully agents in making their politics and their religion and such. And so they are not uh, basing their religion, their politics, their society on our understanding of society, but really building their own for themselves. And so when Viveros de Castro highlights what he calls the logic of identity and difference here, this is a rather important process because we also tend to define things by how we understand them and especially by how we don't understand them. I mentioned that in the context of health, for example, that we know that somebody is sick because they are not healthy and we know that somebody is healthy because they are not sick, which is not very useful uh, for most biological processes, but it is useful to make sense out of exactly what a sick person Person as, as opposed to uh, a person who doesn't feel sick. Now, for the context of indigenous folks, we are talking about uh, explaining their identity not by the fact that they are not like us, but by the fact that they are like themselves. So, Viveros de Castro says, the Arwete case appears to invert the traditional representation that anthropology makes of quote-unquote primitive society as a closed system, a taxonomic theater where every entity, real, conceptual, finds its place in the system of classification, where the order of the universe reflects the social order, where temporality is recognized only to be denied by myth and ritual, where what is defined as exterior to the social, nature and supernature, exists merely to counterproduce the society as a haven of interiority and self-identity. So Viveros de Castro points out that uh, the basic fundamental principles of existence for indigenous folks are just different from the European principles and that it is probably a mistake to look for traces even uh, in the Tyler sense of survival, as he calls them, but even in the in the much uh, finer sense of looking for a similar idea of politics or culture for people who just do not share the same uh, perception of the world as a whole. 
And so the book that Veroz de Castro published is called From the Enemy's Point of View. So that is, in a sense, the place where he is as a person. He explains what an enemy is for the Arahuete. Having spent most of my time living near the Indian post, I could not help being identified by the Arahuete with the things happening there, the whites living there, the processes of interaction occurring between the village and the post. By this, I do not mean to imply that I, did, that I had opted to live in some residential section, or had I tried to copy the group's lifestyle as far as I could, I would have avoided being identified as a Kamara, a white, a subspecies of Awi that is an enemy. But neither does this mean that the Arawete put a barriers between themselves and the Kamara, protected themselves behind the facade, or impeded interchanges between themselves and quote unquote us. So to the best of his understanding, he is considered an enemy that is an outsider to uh, the to the Arawete. But even though he is an enemy, an outsider, a person who is not like them, the Arawete do not make any effort to separate themselves from their enemy in any sense of the term. Now, again, we are looking back at what we mentioned in the context of Madame Blavatsky and uh, and Theosophical Society, where uh, Satan is a cultural hero that needs to be welcome into the world. Well, here, the enemy is, by default, welcome into the world of the Arawete, mostly because they have a connection with the others that is, again, completely different from what we consider other. We tend to put a very strong barrier, whether ideological or physical, between us and others, but there is no such thing here. Now, in the 19th century especially, we started to make sense out of our uh, sciences in the kind of barriers as well, in the kind of people do eat either anthropology or geography or a science or history or natural sciences or biology and whatever. But of course, these things are rather new to our understanding. They're new because they are handy. And obviously, it sometimes it makes sense to enforce these barriers. But most of the time, it really doesn't make sense to uh, try to separate everything because there are so many connections between all kinds of different worlds out there. So, uh, uh, Descola, uh, another uh, uh, anthropologist of, uh, of the ontological kind, whose uh, reading is very dense this week, tells us about how he conceived of different worlds in the context of ontology as especially comparing with uh, indigenous people in Brazil. He was uh, especially focused on the, on, on the Hibaro and the Achuar, uh, two different groups of, uh, of indigenous folks in, in Brazil. But uh, they, just like the people that Vivero studied, had a, a very clear uh, uh, understanding of others that looked like nothing else that he was aware of. So it is through warfare that individual masculine identities are forged. As soon as boys reach adolescence, they are pressed to enter into contact with an Arutam spirit in the course of a visionary trance induced by severe fasting and continuous absorption of green tobacco juice and other hallucinogenic liquids. This terrifying experience enables the adolescent to establish a personal and secret relationship with the ghost of a deceased Favaro warrior who will pass on to him his strength and protection. Arutam first appears in a frightening guise, a glowing head jerking from side to side, a couple of intertwined giant anacondas, or a gigantic RP eagle, which noisily disintegrates as soon as it is touched, then returns in human form in order to deliver a message of assistance. The young man will from then on identify with his arutum by particular in particular by painting his face with a red dye and design that recalls the monstrous figure in which the spirit first revealed itself to him. So at a very early age, uh, teenagers are, uh, are are put in contact in direct contact with the spirit and with uh, something that is otherwise terrifying through the use of drugs, which, again, is something that uh, Western culture would uh, very much frown upon. We have set an age that is uh, 16 or 18 or 20 or 21, depending on who you ask, where drugs are more or less acceptable and any time before is bad, any time after is fine, apparently. But again, right, those are rites of passage that we have set up for ourselves. More importantly, here we are directly touching with the ghost. And again, we have talked about how teenagers are typically uh, uh, getting their first experience of uh, of uh, of uh, identity and building their identity, which is sometimes associated with a spiritual journey. And here, this is a pretty good example of it. But 
as we have mentioned many times over the course of the semester, people like the Hirvaros were typically understood as uh, savages, as barbarians, because they do things that seem to us barbarians, such as this, such as giving drugs to a teenager so that they are in touch with their uh, uh, in here uh, masculine side. And, uh, well, uh, the Vescola points out that uh, not only is this not barbarous, but this is just the way that uh, their identity is created. This is the basis of everything they are. So calling this form of identity barbarian or savage is mostly a way to diminish who they are as people. The predatory attitude that the Hivaros manifest in their relations with others, the need that they feel constantly to incorporate the bodies and identities of their neighbors in order to persist in being themselves, even while being partly determined by that which they capture and assimilate, and their stubborn rejection of any freely accepted reciprocity, all of these are traits that reappear in the relations with non-humans. In this domain, the Hevaros set a higher value on their violent appropriation of substances and fluid than on the free interplay of their circulation. So here we are in a complete opposite register of what we tend to call the soul before this. So uh, we have uh, for a very long time assumed that uh, ind indigenous people uh, see souls in everything and anything, uh, just like uh, um, uh, Western people see souls only in humans. but this Kola points out that this is not the case. It's not like there's a floating soul happening out there. The soul, or uh, their 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 value of some uh, of um, of something spiritual here, has to be acquired in some way. It has to be uh, uh, consciously made into part of your group and made it part of your identity to be able to make sense. That being said, just like. We do not go to any length in explaining how the soul might work because we take it for granted that this is just the way that the world works. Neither does the Hivaro either. This example presents an opportunity to return to consider the way in which an ethos comes to be incorporated as a way of acting according to behavioral principles that are, however, never made explicit. For the schema of predation upon affines is not regarded by the Hivaros as an explicitly transmitted norm. Affines being people who have a link of affinity with, so friends, uh, not enemies. Given that the concepts of predation and affines are not expressed by any words in their language, their tendency to behave toward others in this way is something very internalized that has become implanted as time has passed ever since their earliest days and has been constructed not so much through the assimilation of a system of collective representations, as by the successive inductions based on constant observation of the conduct of adults. So from a very early age, you are uh, kind of uh, learning that this is what your person is. This is what life is. You learn your ontology by just uh, absorbing, imbibing the universe around you. And uh, the rituals in this context just serve to reinforce what you already knew from a very early age, from your contact with others. And in this sense here, ontology is opposed to epistemology. So epistemology being the ways that we explain things, ontology does not go to any length to explain things. Again, right, this is just the way things are. So both the Hevaros and the Tucanos unquestionably belong to the ontological regime of animism. The scholar brings the word of animism, which uh, uh, which uh, Tyler uh, E.B. Tyler invented as an epistemology. So he used this word to make sense of the science of souls in general. To the scholar, this is an ontology. So people, whoever they are in the ontology of animism, uh, uh, live their lives accord and according to a principle where uh, the soul is a thing, it exists, and whatever it does in the world is uh, really secondary. So it does not see animism as a uh, as a springing board to become uh, eventually more civilized, but rather as a way of relating to souls that is unique to that particular ontology. But the principles and values that guide their relations with others could not be more different. The Desana, one of the 16 tribes that make up the Tucano group, offer a good starting point for an examination of those differences for an ethnographic study of them, as provided by Reichel Dorfmanov with the material for the thermodynamic model of the cosmos mentioned at the start of this book. That, that's not very important, but they are based on the, the way in which it rains and the way the sun shines, with which many societies in the Amazonian Northwest are now credited. 
According to this model, the universe was created by Father Son, an omnipotent and infinitely distant being for whom the actual daily sun is, as it were, a delegate to this world. The fertilizing energy that emanates from Father Son animates the entire cosmos and through the cycle of fertilization, gestation, and growth of humans, animals, and plants ensures their vital continuity. It is likewise the source of other cyclical phenomena such as revolutions of the heavenly bodies, the alternating seasons, the variations in, in nutritional resources, and periodical recurrences in human physiology. So uh, at the center of the universe is the sun as a representation of God, and the, the sun is providing the life juice that we have talked about before in the sense of a soul or blood. Now, it might be uh, convenient to call this a matter of soul, but they do not use this word. In fact, they do not have a word like this to refer to what we would call the soul. So we see in their vital principle, our vital principle, and so interpret this as such, but it is not in fact true because uh, again, using this vocabulary of soul would give us this um, this this uh, mistaken idea that their system is any way connected to ours. This is just a completely different way to relate to the universe that we have in. And in a nutshell, this is what ontology does, and perhaps this is what all of our mythological systems are doing for us. They are asking the question of what our world is and, you know, what is normal in there. So the question of whether or not Bigfoot exists or Sasquatch exists, whether merfolks exist, whether zombies are real or how we should relate to them allows us to think of our world as a world that is clearly ours, defined by whether it is okay to come back from life, whether it is okay to transform into a, a siren, whether it is okay to have an ancient ancestor that is still living in there. And again, right, learning how we treat those things, learning how we make sense of those things. So if we see uh, people who are ill as uh, monsters and as people who are suffering and uh, whether or not it hurts to be a monster is another question here. But the, in the, in the final decisions of these conversation is really, are we living in a world where there is room for others or is there not? And who are these others how can they be others and how do we define these others to us that in itself would be the project of an ontology of uh, the myth and the ontological role of the myth for us is studying the world that we live in based on how we live inside of it